Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Marketing with a Book podcast. I'm your host, Henry DeVries. I'm the CEO of Indie Books International, and we're so glad you're here. We like to start with our author roll call, and we have many authors with us today. We have a special guest. Uh, we're going to learn about finding your authentic brand. But before we go to that, let's meet our authors. If you could say your name, your book title, and where you're coming from today. Uh, that'd be great. So uh, let's start off with uh, Christopher Hodges and go to D David Goldman. Hello, everybody. My name is Christopher Hodges. I'm the author of Noble Automation Now, Innovate, Motivate, and Transform with Intelligent Automation and Beyond. And there's the cover of my book over my shoulder. And I am at the galley copy, almost ready to go live with, in the big time. And look at you with a QR code. I mean, for some reason, that's not new technology, but it just feels exciting. So good job. I agree. Thank you. Thanks, David Goldman, and then Diane Place. Thanks, Henry. Hi, I'm David Goldman, and I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I wrote the book, The Road to Happiness, How to Get What You Really Want. Uh, I'm very excited about the book that I'm co-authoring with Henry and Mark LeBlanc called Bringing in the Business. Thanks, David. And um, Diane, and then Mark. Good afternoon, all. My name is Diane Ploys from the San Francisco Bay Area. My book in progress is Questions You Need to Ask Before You Buy a Franchise. Thanks, Diane. Uh, Mark, and then Dr. Carey. Thank you, Henry. My name is Mark LeBlanc, and I'm in downtown Minneapolis, and my latest book is titled Rainmaker a Confidential, co-authored with Henry DeVries and Scott Love. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Dr. Carey coming to you from Denver, Colorado. My book is also in the galley edit stage, and it is called Self-Help on the Go. Okay. Um, Mason, good to see you. It's good to be here. Hello, my Indie Books colleagues and friends. My name is Mason Harris. I'm in the Washington, D.C. area, and my book is called The Chutzpah Advantage. Mason, good to see you. And, I, and I'm Henry DeVries. Wow. What should I pull out? I'm the, I'm the author of How to Close a Deal Like Warren Buffett, now in Chinese. So um, I should pull out the Chinese version sometime. So, oh, yeah, here it is. Now in Chinese. I. All I know is that's my picture. So welcome everyone. So today uh, I had the pleasure of bringing on Julie Wright. Julie and I have known of each other for years and we got together in the fall and I said, really, you know, you should uh, come on the podcast and it'd be great to have you. And uh, let me give her a uh, bio here. So Julie Wright's the president of Wright on communications. It's a full service PR agency and they have offices in Los Angeles, San Diego and Vancouver. Yes, international. Uh, Julie is from the great white north. Uh, she founded Right On Communications in 1998 and now serves clients in North America and Europe. So we do have somebody international here. Um, her former work was in marketing for a financial institution, and previously she was also a radio broadcaster. Oh, a lot of pressure having you on today, Julie. Uh, Julie serves on several private and nonprofit boards. Uh, she loves to travel. On a personal note, she loves travel and enjoys yoga, her family, and uh, raising rescue dogs. Uh, after the presentation, uh, I'll be doing some Q&A, and if you have some questions you want to ask Julie, please put them in the chat, and we'll get to those. But first, I wanted to have an Indie Books welcome for Julie Wright. Thank you, Henry. Uh, it's so great to be here, and I feel like my reading list just uh, grew by about 10 books. So <laughs> thank you, everyone who shared uh, their titles. Uh, and I've been watching some of your past podcasts, and uh, that also has made me want to uh, go out and, and do a lot more reading. So much great expertise and um, really fun to come here and share some of my thoughts and things that I've learned over the last uh, 24 years uh, of being a public relations agency owner about personal brands. 
um, with your authors, uh, because I think that's something as I thought about a topic to explore with everyone today uh, that would add value. Uh, so um, why an authentic brand, Henry? I was um, giving that some thought, and I think that's you know at the heart of a good personal brand. It obviously has to be authentic and based upon who you are. But obviously, it's about more than just who you are. Um, you know, for it to become a brand, it has to somehow elevate you beyond, you know, the ordinary and into the extraordinary. So um, how, how can you do that? And um, my first, you know, suggestion is, of course, to look at the product and the service that you offer in the marketplace and look at those features and benefits and make sure that uh, when you think about cultivating a brand, that it is obviously based on, on your business. And as authors, you know, it's probably based, therefore, on your expertise. Um, but before you can have a successful brand, you have to do something that connects with your audience or connects with your customers on an emotional level. So when you think about your personal brand, it has to be something that um, creates a feeling for your audience. Um, when you think about uh, information, you know, information is, uh, to me, the data points that people use to rationalize decisions they've already made. And feeling and emotion is actually what drives behavior and what drives decisions. So um, successful personal brand does have to create a, a feeling in your audience. Uh, and so then the last piece, as I totally oversimplify this process, but the last piece, and I think the most fun piece and where really success comes from is to take stock of yourself and find that standout characteristic, that thing that you know your parents always commented on or your, your spouse uh, or your friends and family. What is it that everybody knows about you that kind of sets you apart? People always say this thing about you. And it could even be that you're incredibly shy, right? It doesn't have to be this standout larger than life feature, but it's this thing that's pretty unique to you. And once you've kind of identified that, or maybe it's two or three things, you take that thing, and I hope, um, has everyone here watched the movie Spinal Tap? Okay, you take that thing and you turn it up to 11. And when you start to think of some of the, the great, you know, most bold personal brands out there, um, the ones that came to mind as I was thinking about this talk was um, Elon Musk. He's very topical right now. Oprah Winfrey is incredibly, you know, famous for her personal brand. Uh, and then uh, someone like Howard Stern, the, the shock jock. When I said each of those names, like you thought of something, you immediately, it provoked a feeling. And all three of those people are, you know, all very different and unique in their own ways, but deconstruct their personal brands a little bit and you'll start to see kind of the path for your own personal brand. So, you know, Howard Stern, um, he is, uh, you know, excessively outrageous, right? Um, he's a shock jock, that's what he's supposed to, to be. But with his personal brand also comes this, um, you know, neurotic side that is, that is very vulnerable. And when you bring, and he's, and he's very open about both of those things. And when you bring this amplified outrageousness and this amplified neuroticism together in this interviewer and this radio personality, you, know, you create a powerful um, experience for people who tune in to listen to his interviews and they're as interested in him as they are in his guests. And then, you know, flip over to like an Elon Musk, you have the eccentric technology mogul, right? What has he done that, that is at 11? I mean, he's turned a lot of things up to 11, like how many businesses can you be the CEO of? But um, I feel when you think of innovators and innovation and in our innovation economy, you think of uh, disruption, right? Everybody's a disruptor. Well, Elon Musk, he's based, his personal brand is the ultimate disruptor. You know, he breaks Twitter with, you know, a one-off tweet uh, about his stock that gets him in a lot of trouble. And maybe a lot of analysts aren't too, super keen on some of his uh, strategies, but he moves markets with a tweet and he um, changes industries and he has everyone's attention, you know, all the time. Uh, so I like this idea that he's taken the, 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 personal brand of the eccentric technology mogul, you know, and dialed up the disruptor 
element um, to to become, uh, you know, the Elon Musk we all know and uh, puzzle ourselves over. So Oprah Winfrey, what is she known for? What is her um, it factor? What's her 11? And as a uh, media maven, uh, hers is generosity, right? I mean, you get a car and you get a car and you get a car. That was the ultimate expression. And it's funny, if you think about her daytime television show that was her platform, I mean, what was that? But um, free advice, right? Every day, an hour of free advice or you know, this sort of thing as you watched her interviews. And um, uh, you know, I don't know that that's generous, <laughs> but over time she evolved this, uh, this personal brand of generosity. And when she actually gave away a car to everybody in her studio audience, that was it. That was the like ultimate. In, um, in generosity. And she still maintains, like with um, Howard Stern, she still maintains a, a down to earth uh, air about her. She's still like one of the girls that you could sit on the couch with and have a conversation with despite all that, um, which is crazy because she's so incredibly rich. She has no idea how I think we all live. But um, anyhow, that, that I think she the generosity of uh, Oprah totally illustrates this concept. So when your brand is based on who you are, right? It's still real. You just turn it up to 11, um, but that makes it a lot more sustainable, right? It has to be uh, genuine for you. And so, you know, how might you go about assessing uh, what your characteristics are? If you, you know, go online, I think you can find like um, tools and frameworks for identifying your personal brand. But I think a lot of those tend to be focused on job seekers uh, from what I've seen. So. You know, this idea of going to 11 is not something I think you'll see in those kinds of um, tools and assessments. Uh, once you know, you know, what that personal brand is that you're striving for, I think it helps if you develop an origin story for yourself. And to develop that origin story, you can go back in time and you can think about, well, what were those early experiences? Maybe they were childhood experiences or college or early career life or, or family life that where these, um, this characteristic you know, started to emerge. And so how can you connect that into a story where you know, you've always been known for this or um, you know, this has always been a part of your identity and, and now it drives your success or it drives you to service or it drives you to, to publish or be the experts that you are. Um, and then once you know that story, you need to go out and consistently tell it uh, everywhere all the time. <laughs> and so, um, you know, uh, Henry, you and I have talked a little bit, I think, about this and about how you communicate and being in the you know, public relations business and being in the publishing business. Uh, you know, we're in a very fragmented media landscape. So when I'm saying tell this story everywhere and all the time, uh, that can sound really exhausting, I think, for weary uh, authors who have been working very hard just to bring their um, book to life, to now bring this personal brand to life. But, uh, you know, I would say one of your first strategies should be telling it via earned media. And I think, you know, you all do that as you, as you debut your new, not, your new books. But the reason I say earned media is because... Um, one of my colleagues here at uh, Right On Communications, Chance, is always saying a brand is what other people say about you. It's, you know, a brand isn't really what you say about yourself. That's advertising. Um, and PR uh, is also known as earned media, meaning that, you know, the whole intent of public relations is to get other people to say uh, things about you. And when other people say things about you, it's more credible. Um, unless you paid them, and then that's called advertising. <laughs> but when it's uh, when it's publicity and truly earned media, uh, it has an implied third party endorsement. And so I think that's why you know Bill Gates back in the day said, if I was down to my last nickel, um, you know, for my marketing budget, I would spend it on PR uh, because it has such a powerful ability to to build a brand. And then the other uh, opportunities you have for telling the story are obviously your owned assets, your owned media, which is the media you control. That's your website, your newsletters, your videos, um, your webinars. Those are all your opportunities for getting uh, your story told. And maybe not quite as credible, but at least you have 100% control over that message. That's where you can always get it right. Uh, and then social media, where you engage with people. 
uh, and um, where that personal brand can resonate with people. Uh, and then uh, paid while the least credible, you know, if you have the budget for it, you can at least um, pay to promote and build uh, your personal brand over social media, for instance, with targeted boosted posts. Uh, so those are just a few suggestions. The last thing that I wanted to round out this overview with is to think beyond marketing copy, brochures, and that sort of thing, and to approach your personal brand and bringing it to life as bringing an experience to life. So if this is your personal brand, if you are Oprah Winfrey, then of course you give a car to everybody in your studio audience, because that is how you bring this personal brand uh, to life through these experiences. So as authors and as experts, when you adopt the personal brand and maybe uh, you think about, okay, well, how would my readers or how would my webinar participants or how would uh, people at a book signing experience me? At, you know, how would I bring this to life? What would be appropriate for this, for this brand? And then that, those experiences that creates the feeling and the feeling creates the motivation. Does that all make sense? Henry, did I, did I encapsulate that? You did a great job. Why don't we, why don't we go to the interview portion? Sure. The, well, by the way, I heard Oprah in an interview say, and that you, you encapsulated that moment for her, but she said, she sensed the audience didn't understand that everyone got a car. So she was trying to explain to people, you get a car, you get a car, you get you a go. car. Because <laughs> like, they weren't getting it. So as someone who comes from broadcasting and audiences, I thought you'd appreciate that. Yeah, I, that makes so much sense. I've never actually heard you know, that, that that's how that happened. Let's talk origin story. Mm -hmm. Because many of the authors on the line know that when I help them write a book, I'm always talking about chapter two, the second half of chapter two, I call it the mess to success story. I, I like your superhero metaphor better. The origin story is when did Mason Harris become Mason Harris? Uh, when did David Goldman become David Goldman? Um, we'll also call it uh, sometimes your defining paragraph. Mm -hmm. But if your whole life is this continuum and a spectrum, and we were going to make a two-minute movie of your life, what would be those two minutes about? Um, so it's not about, I was born in a log cabin in Kentucky, and I walked five miles to return books to people. You know, It's not the linear story of your life. It's like a movie screenplay, what is the defining moment? What was the eureka, the aha moment? Uh, I'd like to hear more of your thoughts on origin stories. Well, I think it's really hard for people uh, to unpack their own story. And so, you know, it helps to have uh, someone like you or me, I think, working with people to help guide them and distill the story. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, it, you have to find those kernels of, uh, I guess, universal truth, the things that people connect with. And you, you know, the super um, superhero analogy is, is great because, you know, there are heroes and there are villains and a good story has a story arc. So, um, you know, if you went back and studied all the great, you know, films and, and epic poems of millennia ago, you would find they all have, uh, you know, Joseph Conrad unpacked it all, the uh, reluctant hero, right? This person who gets thrust into the narrative. This is where all good stories start. Who, uh, you know, if it's Bambi, Bambi's mother's died, and Bambi is in the forest and doesn't, you know, know how to fend uh, for itself. So, what is what is that um, adversity? Maybe in your origin story, what is that that conflict that um, that drove you or that you overcame uh, that everybody, you know, can. Um, relate to. And I think, you know, when I was thinking about, okay, well, why do, why am I where I'm at in my life right now? Uh, I knew I was always interested in storytelling. I knew I was always interested in 
writing. Um, I published my first newspaper uh, in school in fourth grade, and that was on a mimeograph. That was on the big purple thing, uh, you know, with the purple ink um, for the, the Gestetner machine. Oh my God. It was, you know, ancient technology that nobody today could even, you know, understand. So ancient technology that was just basically a drum rolled over paper. But anyway, I did that at nine years old. And, and, you know, when I look at all that trajectory, I really wanted to, um, you know, write and tell stories. And I did a master's degree in journalism that had a PR course. And I turned my nose up at it, said, I'm not enrolling in that course because I'm going to be a journalist. And then I graduated in 1992 into this recession and I couldn't find that work as a journalist, um, except for the uh, radio broadcaster job, which was actually paying me $8 an hour. I found a PR job Monday through Friday that was paying me, you know, handsomely. And so I took it and worked seven days a week for seven months straight, trying to figure out, well, what am I going to do? I didn't think I wanted to do this. But, you know, um, one day I'm driving home from the PR job. I'm listening to the radio. I hear a news story. It's the lead story at the top of the hour. They are reading the first paragraph of my press release that day about a rail strike, word for word. And I almost drove off the road. I thought that, wow, that, that means I can still tell stories. I can still have the impact. It's just a little different than I thought. And, um, you know, now... 20 plus years later, no regrets. I'm, I'm really happy, you know, that, that that changed the course of my life. But to me, I guess I would look back and say, oh, well, that's, that's my origin story. That's how I wound up here today is just thought I was on this path, hit a little bumper car, went off in this direction and found out I loved it. Mark, could I put you on the spot on your origin story? And I'm thinking of where you started out, you don't have to get the whole one, but starting it out about your inspiration at the age of 21? Sure. Um, in short, um, I had a job once for about six months and found out uh, that I was unemployable at an early age. I'm inspired by the two words, you're fired. And I made a vow to do whatever it would take to make it on my own. And this year, I'll celebrate my 39th year of being in business uh, for myself. Wow. Um, so, so certainly that is um, a defining moment. And of course, Henry, I think maybe the next defining moment is probably 2008, walking, um, stepping in front of the cathedral at Santiago. Yeah, I mean, if so, yeah, the, um, the Camino story, um, and that's an evolution that I was, I witnessed to you taking and now as your personal brand, you've got the image behind you and mm -hmm. um, people became, I was there, people became much more interested in hearing what you had to say about the Camino than about business development. Right. And then, and then the lessons went to business development from there. It was just fascinating to watch the evolution of your authentic brand. Thank um, you. So, uh, Julie, so earned media. Let's talk about earned media a bit, um, because I, I I used to say I'm a recovering journalist, but now since I got hired back by Forbes, I I have lapsed, and I am a journalist. I guess so it's a relapse. It's a relapse. I get uh, pitches, you know, two dozen pitches a day, and they're horrible. I just wanted to tell everybody on this call. Um, my thoughts and then get Julie's thoughts on what not to do. Great. What not to do. Send me this long involved email and at the bottom somewhere is, would you like to interview uh, Mary Schmidt on this? You know, it's like, what's this? You know, it's long. Or, um, hey, I've got somebody you should interview. Uh, doing any stories? That, that, that was today. And here's the guy's name. I was like, what? So, um, Julie, what's your advice on getting earned media? I I would, uh, you know, email, but I would uh, slave over the subject line. And then I would put the same amount of blood, sweat, and tears into the first sentence. 
So, uh, you know, as Henry is, is explaining here, if he gets that epic poem in an email, he, he's just going to skim it, you know, uh, laugh and delete. Um, your, the job of the subject line is to get them to read that first sentence. And the job of the first sentence is to get them not to delete it at the end of that first sentence and to be interested in what follows. So typically, um, uh, I dispense with, you know, pleasantries and introductions and hi, my name is and that sort of thing, and just get to the point. And uh, I may even if I know what I'm trying to, um, what kind of media I'm, uh, story I'm trying to place, if I'm writing to a columnist, I might say column idea in the subject line, so that they know right away you know, that uh, A, it's personal for them. I know they're a, a columnist and B, you know, what is this content? And then the next sentence, you know, after like, hello, Henry, would be uh, the idea for the column in one sentence. And then I would pay it off with, okay, and you know, why my expert or my client uh, as the source for that information, I will almost always include a, um, photograph, a visual of some kind, because, uh, you know, that's really important. I try to make that a rule at our agency, no, no pitches and no press releases without art, uh, because they, um, you know, editors really value that. And, uh, you know, presumably once, once you've had some success with a reporter, after that, you can build a relationship and, and you can have the ni niceties and you can start inserting smiley faces and exclamation points and all that good stuff. But um, I, put so much time and energy into the subject line in the first sentence uh, that you can't, you can't imagine. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't understand that and they feel uh, that it has to be a conversation and it has to be uh, some you know, nice correspondence. Like we're going to, like Henry and I are gonna pass emails and then we're gonna bound them into a book that will, you know, people <laughs> will come back to see the great exchanges between uh, Julie and Henry. That's not gonna happen. So does that? Well, Julie, I'm working on my personality. So, and Mark has helped me. I now say, no, thank you, Julie. And instead of just the delete button. Yeah. I think that's, but that's three words. I'll give you three words, which is more than most journalists will give you um, if they don't like your pitch. Well, because sometimes the, that might provoke a response from the PR person and, uh, you know, oh gosh. So, you know, they're on, um, on Twitter. If you're entertained by these kinds of things, you can um, follow certain accounts where journalists will just share uh, pitches that they've received that are off, uh, off subject. So if you're you know, pitching somebody who writes about um, kitchen implements you know, on um, a restaurant, right? Okay, they are both some, somewhat food writers, right? But what happens is uh, technology has lowered the barrier to entry. And so everybody, can access uh, the internet and do their own research. But what a lot of people do is take a media database, which is software that has, you know, they boast hundreds of thousands of media contacts in it. And so we subscribe to a couple of these, but the work is in going through that content and curating the list and finding the right people and matching the story idea, you know, with the outlet and with the writer, unfortunately, um, a lot of uh, firms and maybe junior people will blast out a pitch and confuse quantity for quality. And so, well, I can send this out. If there's 300,000 people in this database, maybe I should send it to 300,000 people, which is a terrible idea, but um, I'm sure it's been done. That's the theory of more spaghetti against the wall and, something, uh, and yeah. see if something sticks. Right. Um, yeah. There's a if you're looking for one of these databases, Cision, as in decision. They used to be Bacon's, but C I S I O N will do it. I know because I used it before, and then when I was with uh, Forbes.com, they found me and put my mm -hmm. profile out, and that's when the emails really started coming. And it's surprising. I, I thought like. Are these people reading my profile? So I asked one of them. I said, "Why oh, did you send God. this to me?" Well, I just send it to everybody on the list that Cision gave me. 
you know, it's like, why are you bothering me? Um, it was a junior person and they were just, that was their job every day to send wow. something. Oh, it was, it was awful. Well, yeah. So that's something we try to disabuse our uh, junior team members uh, on. And uh, I think that's why there are so many of those funny stories, but I, I have to admit I've put the wrong. I, <laughs> one of my favorites actually is pitching a reporter uh, who's a, a Bay area television reporter on a story for a client. And he has one of those um, first names that sounds like a last name. So I addressed my pitch to his last name. Hi, last name. You know, and when I realized I had done that, uh, I was so embarrassed because I think of that as the kind of thing that's a tell. You know, it, it looks like, you know, you're sloppy or maybe you're just using um, uh, software, you know, to generate this. So I, when I realized I'd made that mistake, I recovered by replying and falling all over myself and trying to be charming uh, to explain, you know, why I did that and why this was still a, a really good story. And it was great. He did respond and looked past it and then came out and, and did the story. Uh, but, you know, if you, to err is human, right? To forgive is divine. <laughs> and rare. And rare. One of our authors is Baldwin Tom. There you oh, go. Baldwin Tom would be my arch nemesis. Dear Tom. Yeah. yeah. Dear Tom. <laughs> it was definitely, definitely. This yeah. is Garvin. I'm speaking of Garvin Thomas. Ah. Very similar. There used to be a reporter in San Diego named Hal Lowe. Ooh. <laughs> and calling him was a, hello. <laughs> yes. Hal, I'm Hal Lowe. Um, on the earned media, let's go a little deeper on that. Best advice I received from a successful author was know your lane, know your niche, niche, however you want to pronounce it, and then pick 25 journalists who write about that. Read what they write about. Uh, engage with them on social media about what they write about. And then when you contact them, sweat bullets, as you said, over your first sentence, and a little proof in there that you know who they are and what they do and what they cover and why you thought this might be for them. Uh, that's absolutely sound advice. And it is time consuming and it is totally correct. And it is the way to have a um, almost perfect batting average. So, uh, you know, we talk about the pitch. And so I also take, extend that metaphor to then the batting average. And if you, we have one software that we use and I can go in and I can see um, how my team is um, doing in terms of the, the volume of pitches and the percent that are actually generating a response or an open rate. And therefore I know, okay, well, somebody probably needs to have a conversation about uh, their research and their targeting and uh, doing the things, Henry, that you just outlined are definitely gonna improve your results. And, and so you do want that, you want productivity and not activity. So activity would be willy nilly pitching, productivity would be doing just what you said. Let's talk about help a reporter out and if you use that and any success there and, and let's explain it to the uh, listeners. Yes, I think it's a, a great resource for authors because what everybody is who's uh, watching today is an expert in a specific domain. And uh, what Help a Reporter Out is, is a tool that connects experts or sources with journalists who are on deadline and looking for someone to comment on a story or help them with some background. Uh, and so they divide the queries out into different categories that are um, you know, business or technology or travel, education, public policy, healthcare. And, and so if you are somebody writing about, um, you know, the franchise uh, book author uh, who introduced herself, you know, there's going to be in the business section a few times a month, someone looking for expertise and commentary on something like um, franchising. And so you would keep your eye out for that. When you see it, you'll just see, um, you know, looking for expert for uh, franchise opportunities in the Northeast or, um, 
need a expert on um, what franchises are hot right now or what questions to ask before evaluating a franchise, right? So you would see that, you would click, you would get taken to a larger description of the story the person is working on and what kind of information they're looking for. There will be a, it's a cloaked email. So uh, you don't get the person's personal email, you get an email um, that's only connected to this query. And it will say their name, the, the outlet they're writing for, although it might say, um, they might not disclose the outlet. And then, uh, something to watch for is responding within deadline because the deadline will be published. The sooner you respond, the more likely you will be the person who they use. And um, be careful when they are specific and say, send me a few, you know, send me the three answers to these three questions, your name, your title, and your website, right? Don't just do that. Don't send them um, something that's off pitch or don't don't ask them questions. Um, would you want to interview me? No, they don't want to interview you. They just want you to provide an email interview, basically. So um, it's, a, it's a really great tool. And I have a funny story if you have a minute for it. Well, we got it. Got it. All right. So um, my uh, intern is someone who's been monitoring the help a reporter out, um, which comes out three times a day. So it can be a lot uh, to stay on top of. And he saw one in December for people who have a lot of folks to shop for, for the holidays, but are, are leaving it to the last minute, even with all the supply chain issues that, um, you know, the world is facing. And it was the Wall Street Journal and their retail reporter. So Brian responds. A few minutes later, he walks in my office and says, hey, um, do you have any tips for my interview with the Wall Street Journal later today? <laughs> so if he can do it, you can do it. Oh. Any, anyway, we, we, um, we set him up, we, we gave him some tips and uh, she enjoyed the interview and she, uh, he, he was the first person quoted in the story. His photo with our logo in the background is in the story. Um, yeah, pretty crazy. So it works. So it works. There it goes. Um, social media tips. Now you talked about earned media, owned media, paid media, but social media. Um, what's some of your best tips for finding your authentic brand, communicating that brand through social media? I think uh, it starts with planning. So social media can feel like a burden, it can feel like a bit of a hamster wheel. I've got to keep feeding this machine. Uh, so if you know what your personal brand is, you know, take the time to develop um, what your voice is on social media. How will you appear? What kind of things would you comment on if they were um, major events or developments that you know are timely and of interest to your um, followers or your, your, your um, customers or readers? And uh, develop uh, an editorial calendar so that it's not so much work for you. Um, and if you've got a team or people who are helping you with this so that you can make sure, you know, they have some, some guide, guidelines for what they're doing and it makes it a lot easier. It reduces the, the lift and the burden. But uh, generally speaking, I think some of the things that help make a social media effort more successful are, you know, being timely and jumping in and uh, sharing uh, your thoughts or commenting on things that are happening right now, you know, and that are relevant uh, to your to your readers. In in other words, you're approaching social media as a conversation and not as a uh, bulletin board, you know, like uh, look at this, look at this, look at this, mm -hmm. right? People get tired of that. Um, I think things that that they're crutches that people will will you know rely upon so oh it's um uh valentine's day so we'll put out like a cute little happy valentine's day no you know no one cares to hear happy valentine's day from just about all of us here except for the you know our valentine 
<laughs> so, um, you know, try to be more uh, creative, right? And just think outside the box a little bit. Go back to the idea of creating an experience. How would, you know, you want people to experience you on the social media version of you, right? Yeah. One of the pieces of advice I've really liked in the last year is if you're going to be a thought leader, come up with a list of 50 thoughts, 50 interesting thoughts, and then, like the idea of the editorial calendar, drop them in regularly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, something in our brainstorming today about social media that uh, Devin DeVries, um, our VP of production, came up with from some studies she's been doing is be generous in your comments to other people and not just a, like sometimes I'll do amen or agree, but actually do a whole sentence. Um, and the algorithms prefer that and we'll pick that up. But also the people, think about yourself when you've posted something and uh, nobody comments on it. Um, you know, that's, that's a little discouraging. I really like to encourage the Indie Books family of authors to be amplification sources for each other on social media. Um, you know, link in with people, uh, follow them, and give supportive, positive comments to them. It's good for them, it's good for the relationship, and it's good for you too. So those are some other things uh, that you might want to be thinking about. Uh, the owned media, um, is that like your YouTube channel and your website? Uh, speak more about yeah. owned media. So I, I think owned media these days might be called content. You know, you hear about content marketing. Right. Uh, owned media is your website, your newsletter, uh, your videos, uh, webinars. It's anything you have absolute control over, you produce and you put out into the world. And so YouTube, the video that you put on YouTube is your owned content. The social media part of YouTube are the comments uh, you know, that, that are shared on that video, the likes and so on. Um, YouTube is also owned by Google and the second largest search engine in the world. So um, using YouTube for optimized content to help people find you um, and generate links back to um, your other content is a, is a great strategy. But uh, telling your story on owned media, you know, it uh, takes a little more time and that thought leadership, Henry, you were talking about having 50 different topics. You know, if that means you have a blog then a week, every week on your website, um, you're feeding the beast and you're putting content out there that is discoverable via Google and will drive people, you know, to your website. When you drive traffic to your website and you get found for your area of expertise, your domain authority of your website starts to grow. Your domain authority is something that uh, is ranked on a zero to 100 scale. It's somewhat algorithmic, so it's harder you know, to get to those upper echelons, but like a daily newspaper might be in the you know, 90s, whereas uh, a fledgling author's page might be 14. And so something that you might wanna monitor um, and you might need a third-party service like Moz or um, SEMrush, which are two apps to um, give you a report of your domain authority, but it might be something you want to monitor to see like when I'm creating owned content on my website, you know, is it helping me uh, via my Google Analytics get found and driving traffic for me? And is that traffic helping me sell books? Does that make sense? Oh, makes makes total sense on that. Um, I also want to encourage people, I, I don't know, technically this is own media, but um, how my fortunes changed when I was hired by Forbes.com to write five columns a month. And because I'm Dutch, it wasn't until they say, they said, we'd like to pay you to write five columns a month. And not that they're paying me that much, you know, it's, uh, it's Costco money. I could go to Costco with it, you know, and, and uh, have a good day. But the exposure that it brings 
that some of my articles have been read by 150,000 people. And we started to notice LinkedIn invitations go up, Facebook invitations go up, all these things go up. And then the ability just to say to people, oh, um, if you'd like me to consider a column on you, I can send uh, some instructions on that. Oh, by the way, Julie, you read mine at the bottom. It said, do not ask me for an interview. I don't have time. It's not in your best interest either. Um, so yeah, that's, um, somebody checked me out before they hired me once and they, and they said, well, I've interviewed five of your authors and I've decided to hire you. I said, that's great. What did they say? They all said the same thing. I said, what was that? They said, they all said you were honest. And I thought, hmm, honest. Hmm. Hmm. And he said, yeah. One told you his idea for a book and you said, well, nobody's going to buy that book. I said, oh, yes, brutally honest. I'm working on the brutal part. Uh, it's just more Dutch directness. We, we, we like to be clear in our communications. Well, you're very clear in your communications, Julie. Thank you so much for uh, spending time with us today. Do you have one last thought, one tip, one bon mot that you want to end with? Um, well, no, I would kind of held that helper reporter out for my hip pocket. Um, but yeah, I think. Dang you, Henry DeVries, you stole no, my encore. No, I, you know, I, I left it all on the floor, right? What's the, you know, I left it all in the field. That's left it. it all in the field. Left yeah. it all in the, the field. Money, the money was all up on the yeah. screen during the movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well. Uh, Thanks, thank Henry. You so much. Just on the Harrow thing. Um, so you know, it's a long shot. That long shot has come in for me several times. I've gotten things in Forbes before I worked for them. Um, the AA, AARP magazine, which I think had 30 million circulation. This was just from one of those and being quick on the draw. Um, and and the fact that you can say I'm an author and because they made it so easy for the journalist to, because we don't get paid for the amount of time we write. We get paid per story. So it's how can we do the bestest in the leastest amount of time? Um, and sometimes you need one more, just one more quote and that email can provide it and you get in and can get a big payoff. And sometimes it can go really deep. Julie, thank you so much. Um, I guess I should uh, call you on July 1st uh, to wish you a happy Canada Day. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And on October, to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, yeah, and very on good. April 1st, a happy Revenue Canada Day. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's their version of April 15th, everybody. This I spent seven years in Canada, so I, I speak Canadian. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Henry. Let's give a, a nice uh, waving round of applause for Julie and look forward to speaking with you on a future episode of Marketing with a Book podcast.